Okay, as people are signing in, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Sarita Hahn. I'm Assistant Director for SOSFE Summer Institute of Art. And this is our third uh, public lecture for the series, Deep Ecology in the Cognitive Capitalocene. Um, we are uh, being hosted by the Brooklyn Rail. So many thanks to Brooklyn Rail for uh, working with us on this program this summer. And we're very excited today to be speaking with Franco Berardi. So I'm going to hand it over now to the uh, founder and co-director Warren Nydick to uh, introduce today's talk. Hello everyone. And thank you for joining us uh, today for our lecture. Uh, with Franco Berardi in the context of the Sosfe Summer Institute of Art. Uh, Franco has been an incredibly important part of this program. Uh, he was at our first uh, session high in the mountains of Switzerland at Sosfe. And I remember him telling me that uh, the altitude was um, causing him some breathing problems. So the next year we had to change the site of our uh, of the Sasfe Summer Institute to Berlin so that we could accommodate uh, Franco because without him, we wouldn't have a program. Um, of course, he's one of the most important voices uh, for cognitive capitalism and understanding cognitive capitalism uh, that we, you know, as everyone knows, is a very important part, a component of, uh, of uh, our Sasfe program and um, considered an important component of forms of resistance, although it's very difficult to imagine forms of resistance in today's technocratic, bureaucratic nightmare with all the crap that's going on in the world. But I still have hope. I'm still optimistic. Okay, but not everybody is, and we understand that. But cognitive capitalism, I think if we all really understood cognitive capitalism and, and the kinds of ideas that it allow, allowed us to, to, to understand and to see, I think that we could make changes in our society. Anyway, with, without further ado, I just wanted to introduce Franco. Well, you all know him, it's, uh, it's, you know, I don't really have to say very much, but today he's gonna talk about the divorce between the world and the earth uh, from the point of view of the nervous cognitive energies um, of, of the social body. And I, I think that's really uh, key. You know, wh where is the social body? Where is the carnate body in cognitive capitalism? And is the fact that, that it's kind of become uh, divorced from labor and divorced, we're all sitting in front of screens, we're not doing very much in our, we've now doing mental labor. Is that one of the reasons that this incarnate body, is that, is that disentangling us from, 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 the, from the notion of deep ecology? But anyway, he'll have a lot more to say about that. Um, but just to give you a little bit uh, of information about Franco, he founded the magazine A Traverso in 1975 to 1981 and was part of, of the staff of Radio Alice. Later, he fled Paris, where he worked, he fled to Paris, where he worked with Felix Qatari. Publications include uh, Mut uh, Mutazione e Cyberpunk, The Soul at Work from Alienation to Autonomy, Heroes, Mass Murder and Suicide, Phenomenology of the End, uh, Future Ability, Breathing Chaos in Poetry, and the Third Unconscious, the Psychosphere in the Viral Age. Over the last 10 years, Barati has lectured at many universities around the globe. So, so thank you very much, Franco, and let's all give him a, a virtual hand. Thank you. So. Well, <clears throat> I want to start quoting uh, a, a, a Japanese philosopher. I, I am surrounded by Japanese philosophers. Uh, Yun uh, Hirose is with me, and uh, Sabu Kosho is uh, in this book. Um, this book, uh, Radiation and Revolution is an attempt to, to understand from a theoretical point of view the, the implications 
the meaning, the consequences of uh, what uh, may be called uh, the Fukushima event. Actually, in this book, uh, uh, Sabukosho is uh, very much insisting on this um, um, idea that uh, um, not only from uh, the point of view of the Japanese population, by in a broader sense, uh, Fukushima marks uh, a, a new step, a new phase of uh, consciousness of the effects of, um, um, of the ecological catastrophe. Uh, I don't want to elaborate about Fukushima because everybody knows what I'm talking about, but I want to um, uh, to quote uh, some uh, sentences from uh, the book. First of all, he says, we consider the Fukushima event to be an epitomic moment, uh, philosophically, philosophically speaking, this is an ontological shift from dialectics to immanence, from totalization by capitalism and the state to the omnipresence of singular events. In this shift lies the prospect of planetary revolution to be grasped in the decomposition of the world and the rediscovery of the art. Decomposition, disintegration of the world, of the world history of the world as the place of uh, materialization, concretization of the human activity, of the human will, and of the human labor, of course. This is the world. The earth is the physical dimension of uh, uh, in which uh, uh, the history of the world has taken place. So, all of a sudden, Sabu Kosho suggests, all of a sudden, after Fukushima, we got aware of the fact that the dynamics of the Earth of the physical dimension of the planet, uh, these dynamics uh, are diverging from uh, the history of the world. And uh, all of a sudden, we are aliens in a planet, a planet that is uh, more and more unknown more and more uh, beyond our possibility of knowledge and beyond our possibility of uh, transformation. This idea of a divergence between the word intended as uh, the product of human activity, and the earth intended as the physical dimension in which the history of the world has taken place, this divergence may be reconsidered, may be contextualized in the relation between different, different spheres of cognitive activity. I mean, the, the world, the world is uh, 
the history of consciousness. And the art is the neurological history of the brain. We are living in a moment of increasing divergence between historical consciousness, which also implies the dimension of the unconscious, and the evolution of the brain. This is a problem that um, I have been tried to, uh, to write about, to understand uh, the, the relation between the brain and the mind, the relation between the, the physical, neurological uh, ground of our intellectual of our cognitive activity and the historical product of uh, uh, the brain activity. I've tried to understand uh, this relation because I think that uh, the future does not belong uh, to, to historical and political uh, voluntary activity. Will, the human will is over. It's a faculty that means nothing. I mean, we can will uh, as much as we want, but our Voluntary activity is less and less relevant from the point of view of uh, the evolution of the world. I mean, five centuries ago, when Niccolò Machiavelli wrote uh, his most important book uh, titled The Prince, uh, he is speaking of the human will in terms uh, that uh, have been very important in the history of modern politics. He says, will is better. The prince is the owner of power because his will can be imposed to the multifarious becoming of what he calls fortuna. That means the complexity of the human events in the history. So he says, uh, the will of the prince is the ability to submit fortuna, which is a female, Machiavelli adds, and females uh, in the macho vision of uh, uh, Machiavelli, the female likes to be submitted to the superior will of the prince. This machista vision is very realistic uh, when it comes uh, to the history of, of modern politics, because during modernity, the faculty of will has been able to submit the multifarious reality of the events of the world uh, according to a project, a project of uh, civilization, of capital accumulation, of the construction of the state, uh, uh, and so on and so on. History, the history the modern history of the world. But now, now, the problem is that Fortuna, the female, which in the Machiavelli visions corresponds to the complexity of events, Fortuna has grown too complex, too complicated, chaotic if you want. So the ability to 
to govern is over. And the relation between will, action, and power is broken. No more power. No more potency. No more possibility of reducing, of submitting the complexity of the world to the linear, rational will of uh, political power and of uh, the economic uh, uh, system, no more. Our will is uh, more and more vacuous, more and more empty. And uh, the other side of our will is impotence. And the growing perception of uh, a sort of uh, humiliation of the human mind, which is uh, overwhelmed by the infinite complexity of the late modern reality and overwhelmed by the infinite potency of uh, the very product of our past activity. The German philosopher Gunther Anders, who is uh, um, little known in the English speaking, in the Anglo speaking uh, world, who is not translated uh, in my knowledge in Italy or uh, in, in England, Gunther Anders, uh, he was a Jewish and a German. And um, he flied away from the, the, the Nazist uh, uh, country uh, before the Second World War, but uh, he was uh, deeply impressed uh, after the war in the 60s, uh, he was deeply impressed by the hyperpotency of the nuclear technology, the atomic bomb, which used to be a sort of uh, uh, um, scarecrow in the 60s, uh, the intelligentsia, the intellectual uh, um, people were very much concerned, everybody was very much concerned about the nuclear bomb in the 60s. Then we forgot about it for many reasons, because of the end of the Cold War, uh, because of the defeat of the Soviet Union. So the world was unified, global, and happy. Happy to be exploited to death by the neoliberal bosses. So the atomic bomb was forgotten. That does not mean that the atomic bomb disappeared. On the contrary, the nuclear bomb has proliferated everywhere. So now we are not dealing with MAD, the mutual assured destruction that was supposedly preventing nuclear war in the old good days of the bipolar Cold War. Now the Cold War is not back. We live in a much worse world than the bipolar Cold War of the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. We live in a world in which the atomic bomb has proliferated beyond the possibility of any control. The very logic of deterrence, of mutual assured destruction, which was uh, in a sense, guaranteeing that nobody will launch the bomb because it would be too dangerous for himself, for him. That logic is out of fashion 
because it's a logic that means something when the players are two. If the players are three or five or seven or nine, the mutual assured destruction means less and less. So we have entered in a dimension in which nuclear war is not only a possibility, but more and more a very likely, likely probability of uh, the of the future. But I don't want to speak about uh, this uh, enormous political problem. I want to deal much more with uh, the cognitive dimension of the present danger. The cognitive dimension. When I say cognitive, I am implying different levels of my reasoning. I am speaking, of course, of the physical condition that makes possible the cognitive activity, I mean the neurological condition. But at the same time, when I say cognitive, I imply also the activity, the intellectual, productive, theoretical, poetical activity that is made possible by the interaction between the brain and the world. My opinion to, to say it uh, in a brutal way, in a direct way, my opinion is uh, that we are living in the age, in a moment uh, that is specifically defined by a breakdown of the relation between the brain and the activity of the mind. We are living in a moment in which the effect of the hyper exploitation of the brain that has clearly marked the last 40 the years, the years of the neoliberal digital exploitation, the, this kind of hyper-exploitation has provoked an effect that is more and more visible as an effect of mental breakdown. So the hyper-exploitation of the nervous energies of the human mind has been and still is a process that runs parallel to the process of hyper-exploitation of the physical resources of the planet. But what is the effect of this uh, long-lasting process of hyper-exploitation of the nervous energies. Uh, exhaustion, an effect of exhaustion. The concept of exhaustion, in my opinion, is crucial if we want to understand the day-by-day uh, life uh, and agony of the of the planet exhaustion. What is the exhaustion, and what is the premise of a process of exhaustion? The premise, in my opinion, is the mythology of expansion as a central uh, mythology of. Um, modern culture, we have been living for 500 years uh, under the uh, idea, under the, the myth, in a sense, 
the productive myth, I am not saying that it is uh, an empty myth. It is a mythology full of strength, energy, and productivity. The myth of expansion, infinite expansion, boundless expansion. Uh, I refer, obviously, to the colonial expansion of uh, the, the European uh, civilization. Europeans have created their modern prosperity on the possibility of uh, submitting uh, countries in the different continents of the world in a project of uh, limitless expansion. At a certain point, the art uh, was totally colonized. The space was totally colonized. So the need for expansion led us, led the human race to imagine another possibility of expansion, not expansion in the space, in the territorial space, rather expansion in time expansion in the dimension of the mind, which is the dimension of time. Growing productivity, digital colonization of the mind and the infinity of this process. The digital network is a boundless dimension. We say that it's true. Actually, it's true. We can conceive of the digital dimension or as a, an infinite dimension. Problem is that the mind is not infinitely expandable. The problem is there. The problem is in the limited feature, the limited measure of the potency of the human brain and uh, of the neurological functioning of the human brain. You see that I am distinguishing between the limits of the neurological and the infinity of consciousness. But the infinity of consciousness is grounded on a a limited potency is based on the limited potency of the brain. It's the brain, it's the nervous energy that uh, at a certain point started to collapse. I think that much more than living in the age of the irreversible catastrophe of the physical em environment, we live in the age of the mental collapse of uh, the human ability to produce, to create. I see here a, a sort of dilemma, a sort of um, um, problem of theoretical problem that I am, am unable to solve. And my dilemma, my problem is the following. The, we have reached the limits of the expansion of the neurological potency. You can develop new technologies, uh, you can accelerate the technological machine, but you cannot accelerate the human brain, the human neurological activity beyond a certain point. And that point has been reached. We are beyond that point. So I wonder, can we imagine a, a an evolution of 
the mind which can be consciously conceived, imagined, governed. I mean, can consciousness act on the very physical um, uh, precondition of consciousness itself? Can consciously, can we consciously act on our brain? I think that this is a fundamental question for the for the future. And I come to the to the present situation. I mean, I speak of uh, a mental collapse. And uh, I said before that the mental collapse has been provoked by the acceleration of uh, um, cognitive productivity during the decades uh, of uh, the neoliberal digital uh, capitalism. But this is not enough because we have to, to uh, take in account another side of the problem. The other side of the problem is the growing old of the human brain. When I say growing old, I am essentially referring to a process of exhaustion of the, of the civilization, of the imperialistic civilization of the West. If you accept, if you allow me to use a, a nasty, a, a vulgar expression that is not uh, scientifically founded, but useful, I will say the white race. The white race is growing old. I know the white race is a non-existing thing. The white race is a mythology. Yes, yes, it's a mythology. But you know that is a very, very effective mythology. It has been a very effective mythology. We have, we, the imperialist Christian uh, uh, Western civilization, we have uh, thrived on the, the uh, of the non-existing concept of the white race. We have identified ourselves in relation to the other cultures in Russian terms, that is the point. But now, now the problem is that for many reasons that we should understand in detail, and I have not time to do that, the white race is agonizing for demographic reasons, first of all, <laughs> demographic reasons. Secondly, because uh, of, the, of the very effect of, uh, of white imperialism that has provoked the, a, a situation in which uh, uh, our relation with the rest of the world is crumbling. I remember a time in which everybody was in, in, in my environment, everybody was speaking of Mao Tse Tung. Mao Tse Tung is an old guy. I have never been a Maoist, huh? never. Not for one single day. My sister was very much Maoist, and we were all the time discussing about that. But why I am talking of Mao Tse Tung? Because uh, Mao Tse Tung was not a Marxist. I mean, his, uh, his crucial idea was not uh, the, the uh, worker class uh, struggling against uh, capitalism, he was much more interested in the idea 
that oppressed people of the South uh, will fight against uh, the, the imperialist uh, capitalism of the, of the North. Um, I disagreed with this idea. I said not only when the, the social class of the workers will be able to lead the wall of humanity uh, towards emancipation, only at that point we will be able to really change things. I am talking of antiquity. I'm talking of very ancient uh, problems. Um, we know that the, 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 the reality has taken a different path. But Mao Zedong is back because that said a, a, a look at what is happening now in the world. I mean, uh, let, me, let me say two words about the war that uh, we, the West, the free world, are fighting against uh, Russia. Is it, uh, is it a war between uh, two different wars from the anthropological point of view, not at all? Russia is part of our world. I will say more. Russia is the avant-garde of the white collapse, of the white mental collapse. Russia is the avant-garde of the white imperialism, of the white aggressiveness. So what, what is happening? We say the West, but the West is not a geographical concept. Yes, if, if you... Seems like maybe Franco froze. Let's see if we can get him back. I think he had to uh, get kicked off, so he'll probably sign back. What happened at this? I'm hey, back. Hey, Franco, you're back. Hey. You, you, I'm sorry. You froze for a minute and then you disappeared. So you probably yeah. just got missed connection. No, so, I, I, I was speaking of the, of the war. Yeah. And of and Russia. Putin as the avant-garde of the white imperialists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So, so I think that the war in Ukraine... I don't want to elaborate about the political details of this, this horrible situation. Just I want to say that it's a war between white and white. It is a war between imperialists of Russia and imperialists of the West. It's the suicide, the final suicide of the white race. If we try to understand what's happening at a broader uh, level, if we, if we understand that the majority of the countries of the global South uh, are totally indifferent and do not share our Western indignation against Russia, we realize that the problem is that Russia has, is being used by the 
south as a tool to break the domination of the white race. So it is a mental collapse. It is a mental breakdown, this war. This war cannot be understood, cannot be analyzed, cannot be realized if we do not start from the understanding that this is the symptom of the mental breakdown, of the agonizing and senescent uh, brain of the of the white uh, of the white race. Um, the problem now is what comes next, and. Uh, it's another way to, to, to think about the problem that I said before, the relation between the brain and the mental activity, the brain and consciousness. Can we reactivate the human brain in a conscious way? Can consciousness consciously act for the reactivation of the neural ground of, of mental activity? This is, in my opinion, the, the same question that we ask when we ask what comes after this war. You know, in Bologna, my city, today we have a temperature of 37, 38 degrees. Normally, in this season, it's uh, 28, 29, 30. And secondly, the rivers uh, of Italy from south to north uh, are totally dry, totally dry in June. What, what's happening? This is the effect of the protracted exploitation of nature, the submission of nature to, the, the, to profit, to the capitalist accumulation as provoked the situation in which we are now, a situation which is very, very serious because we are going towards uh, a scarcity of water. But the same can be said at the level of the human brain. We are very close to the moment in which our ability to consciously act on our social life and also on our uh, on our brain will be over. The, the window of possibility now is all about a mental invention, is all about the ability of cognitive labor to self-organize. I know that it's very, very far. What I say is very, very far from reality. Reality is that uh, Germany is reopening the coal mines. <laughs> you know, Germany, the greens of Germany are reopening the mines of coal. The same is happening in China, in the United States, in Italy too. We are reopening coal mines because the war is our priority. First of all comes the defense of the free world. First of all comes the defense of democracy. Democracy. Democracy what? Where is democracy? In Ukraine or in the United States of America? 
Can you say that the United States of America deserve to be the leader of the free world? I mean, uh, a country that in three months will be the country of uh, of the extreme right, the country in which uh, Trump uh, is poisoned to win the election in two years, and he will not win someone worse than Trump will win? Is it the world that we are fighting for in Ukraine? No, that, 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 that does not make sense. The reason of this war is the mental breakdown of the white brain. The reason is here in the inability to think outside of the spiral of panic and depression, the post-COVID reality is a reality of widespread depression. I read in the New York Times uh, two weeks ago that according to an investigation on 18,000 people, uh, it seems that 27% of the of the American population uh, has uh, uh, shows uh, symptoms of clinic depression. 57% of the population between 15 and 25 years are showing symptoms of depression. But you know what happens in a depression? Think of what happened 100 years ago. The Germans, the Italians, the Russians, in a depressive situations, chose the Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin. This is the outcome of a depression. The depression can lead, generally leads to aggressive reactions. Depression is uh, the perfect uh, a hotbed for fascism. Sometimes. But I also think that depression may be the starting point of a totally different direction of our future. Depression can lead to what the American newspapers call great resignation. Resignation, what a wonderful word. Resignation for, for an atheist like me seems to be bad at the first, uh, in the first moment because uh, uh, it's the acceptance uh, of something that cannot be accepted. But in the English language, resignation means something different. Resignation is, yes, accepting the unacceptable, but also going away. The great resignation that the American newspapers have been talking about in the past months is four millions and a half workers not going back to their job. And the same is happening everywhere. The same is happening in China, where uh, 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 has been invented a new word uh, that means those who, who don't want to leave their bed. And the same is happening in Europe, is happening in Italy, everywhere. People, is, uh, people are leaving job, consumption, politics, procreation. The women of the world do not, do not want to give sons, children to the homeland. Interesting thing, everywhere in China, like in Italy, like in Japan, like all over Europe. And uh, so the refusal of work, the refusal of politics, the refusal of consumption, the refusal of procreation. 
this, in my opinion, is the starting point for a rebalancing of the relation between our potency and our possibilities. This is the starting point of a rebalancing between uh, mind and brain, a period of psycho deflation, a period of uh, refusal, a period of, if you want, uh, depression, because depression is not always a bad word, in my opinion. James Hillman said that depression is a form of knowledge and it is the form of knowledge which is more close to the final truth that I think that we should start from depression. Depression as a positive condition for relaxing our brain and for abandoning the promises of modernity. One last thing, note that the word resignation may be interpreted in a third way, not only accepting the unacceptable, not only the abandoning job, but also resignification, giving a new meaning to our relation with the world, to our relation with a, a, a needs to our relation with the body of the others and so on. Stop the world and start coming out from depression in a way that is not relaunching growth, not relaunching expansion, not relaunching productivity, but finding a new, a new harmony, if I may say so. A new harmony with the irreversible decay of the white domination of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Franco. That was really, really amazing. Uh, we're going to try to fit in some questions. Uh, just to explain a little bit, we'll have a short Q&A and we'll have questions within uh, the program here, as well as if anybody on YouTube who's watching wants to type some questions in there as well. And uh, some people were also asking that these, uh, these lectures this week are going to be saved to YouTube so they can be rewatched later and we'll probably also share them in our archive uh, later as well. Arita, so, can, can, can I say uh, yeah. uh, one word? I am a little bit deaf, uh, so my ears are... So um, um, please, if you want to ask a question, speak slowly. Yeah. Or better, write down your question and I will answer. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a question from Veronica. If you'd like to go ahead and speak slowly and or type it, that would be fantastic. I was just about to type it out. Um, you know what? I'll do both. Uh, thank you for the lecture. It was, um, it was really great. Um, I am curious about how you um or if you could speak to how you envision embodiment in the future but can can you repeat yes let me write it down thank you the question was could you speak to embodiment <laughs> You know, the, 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 the word embodiment has uh, uh, more than we are one uh, sense. The, the embodiment uh, that um, you are referring to, I suppose, uh, refers uh, to uh, the, I, I would say, the 
singularization, the bodily singularization of the mind, uh, of the mental activity, if you want. And when we say embodiment in, uh, in, in the sphere of uh, philosophical or biotechnological uh, uh, thought, uh, we refer to a process uh, that is uh, um, that is not an historical process. Uh, I think that uh, now we have to think to the embodiment process uh, as uh, contextualized in history. I mean, my body, the body of the known person like me, is uh, a acting also intellectually is acting in with a different prospect with different in a different horizon for instance a different horizon of temporality so the history of uh, a, um, of the white mind the white embodiment has been essentially linked to the preconception of expansion, the idea of an infinite growth. Well, we have to rethink, and um, I use the word think, uh, but um, it's not only the rational thought that is interesting for me, it's much more the affective thought, the physical thought. I mean, the the, the, the condition, uh, the, the crisis that we are living uh, is uh, also a crisis of the relation between unconscious and consciousness. The, the neoliberalism has provoked a sort of explosion of the human unconscious. Strictly speaking, we may say that the unconscious has been externalized by advertising, uh, uh, media bombardment, and so on, and so on. The, the problem now is how can we come out from this kind of psychotic embodiment? How can we recreate the conditions for the invention of a, a consciously limited dimension of our life. You know, the problem of, uh, of uh, senescence, uh, of growing old, uh, and the problem of death has been marginalized, expelled by the, the modern uh, mythology of expansion. Uh, that, uh, is uh, forbidden in the field of the social discourse. But the pandemic has obliged us to think to the reality of that and to the reality of growing old. So probably we have to start from this crisis, final crisis of our preconception, preconception of, uh, of eternity, eternity. Capitalism is essentially based on eternity. The idea that accumulation is eternal. So we never die because we continuously accumulate. Anyway, thank you. I thank see. you. I think Levin has a question yeah. and then Barry. So Levin, you wanna go next? Oh, we can't hear you. Well, well yes, yes, you know, I, I... But I think he read your question anyway. I read the question of Levani, uh, thank you. And uh, I obviously, I must refer here to Donna Haraway, because it's clear that uh, the philosopher uh, who has best expressed the, the present uh, condition 
the pandemic condition and its implication is done our way. Why so? I especially refer to staying with the trouble, this, view, this book that uh, I have read many times uh, and I, I cannot really totally understand. There is always something that escapes to me in that book, but at the same time, it's a book that gives me the possibility of abandoning the idea, the limited idea of human agency, the redefinition of agency from a point of view which is not only human. And uh, that means also that uh, the, the COVID experience uh, has been, first of all, the experience of the coming back of the concrete and invisible concretion of matter, called virus, has been able to jeopardize the social order, the theoretical order, and so on and so on. But at the same time, the virus the coming back of concreteness uh, has provoked an effect of explosion of the order of abstraction. Abstraction uh, uh, is, uh, is the crucial tool for the eternification of capitalism. Capitalism is eternal because it is in the domain, in the kingdom, of abstraction, abstraction from love, or abstraction of money, and so on and so on, abstraction of communication, and so on and so on. But at a certain point, this eternity of capitalism has been broken and jeopardized by the coming back of the concreteness of virus. But now, Concrete is proliferating everywhere. It's no more only a problem of viruses. Now it's also, for instance, uh, a problem of uh, uh, supply chain disruption. The supply chain disruption is a novelty in the history of the, of the modern economy. Of course, we have known uh, in the past uh, uh, supply chain disruption, but now, now the supply chain disruption is the, the core of, 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 of our problem. But you remember the good old times of uh, Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs, the old good times of the financial dictatorship, finance is over. No, I know it's not over. They are rich and not more rich. Rich of what? The point is that money is losing its potency. Money is losing its charm. Because if you have COVID and you don't have the vaccine, you can have all the money you want, you will die. If you don't have um, something like chips coming from a factory in southern China and your factory is in California, but you do not receive those chips, you have money, but you will not be able to do your job and so on and so on. My thesis is that for the first time, in uh, late modernity, we are witnessing a crisis which is not provoked by the internal game of capitalist abstraction. We are dealing with something that comes from the body, from the virus, from malady, from sickness, death, uh, supply chain disruption, and so on and so on. Thanks, uh, Franco. So we have a question from Barry, and then I'm yeah, going to bring over a question from, Hello, from YouTube. Hello, Barry. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I, I receive your messages, and I thank you for that. But it's a long time we have not met in physical, uh, well, in the physical world. Anyway, it will happen sooner or later, I hope. Um, 
you may distinguish the Western white civilization on one hand and the global South on the other, but as the global South for the most part entered into the expansion. Yeah, so is there in the outside? Of course, you are right. Of course. I mean, the reality is I, I've been uh, I've been too short in my exposition. I know I, it happens to me that I wanted to say everything I, I, I do not succeed. So uh, many, many things are, are um, confused. I am confused, yes. But I try to, to, to explain, thanks to Barry. Um, well, don't take me wrong. I am, when I said, um, Mao Tse Tung uh, was right uh, when he saw that, uh, uh, when he predicted that the main contradiction was not between worker class and capitalism, but uh, oppressed population of the South. Uh, when I said so, I did not mean that uh, I agree with that vision, and I consider that vision as a progressive, good, uh, humanistic, not at all. Because if we uh, look at the global south, what do we see? We see Brazil of Bolsonaro. We see India of Norendra Modi. We see China of Xi Jinping. I mean, we see fascist countries. Let me. Uh, be be uh, uh, be fast. Um, we see a sort of uh, resentful global South, which has no idea of a new universality. This is why I stay Marxist against the coming back of Mao Zedong, because Marx. Of course, he was speaking of class struggle. Of course, he was breaking the world in workers against capitalism and so on. But his idea at the very end was a universalist idea. He said the partiality, the unilaterality of the worker class is going to create the conditions for a new universality that call it communism. So there was an universalistic idea in Marxism. Uh, no universalism is present in the, in the, in, in the surrounding uh, situation. I mean, the, the global South is, is uh, fighting for its own interest in a very egoistic, selfish, and particularistic way. At the same time, uh, uh, um, what we see is the decay, the emptying of the universalistic values of, uh, the, of democracy. Democracy is less and less credible uh, after uh, the last 10 years of financial dictatorship. Remember Greece, remember what has happened uh, in, uh, in, uh, in many pl 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 places of the world. So we have a decay of universalism and a rise of southern particularities that resemble more and more to authoritarian, aggressive particularities. What I see in the next future is not a, a good progressive composition of, of different uh, realities of the South. No, what I see in the future is global civil war is permanent war. The Ukrainian war is only the beginning of an age of chaos. Nevertheless, I repeat, this moment is marking the end of the white supremacy, 
white supremacy is over. And when I say white supremacy, I do not refer only to Donald Trump. I refer also to Joe Biden because white supremacy belongs similarly to Trumpism and to the neoliberal financial dictatorship. This is over. This is over. We are coming out from the age of capitalist, of financial capitalism and of financial dictatorship. But we are not entering the good world of an international composition. No, not at all. We are entering the age of global chaos. And we have, philosophically speaking, we have to be able to understand how to deal with chaos. This is the biggest question of our time. Felix Guattari has spoken of this point, of this problem in his last book, Chaos Mose. You remember Chaos Mose, 1992. He was dying, unluckily, because in that book, he has anticipated what we are living now. He says there is a cosmic spasm, a spasm. In an acceleration of, uh, of the body, of the human, of the planetary body, and of the planetary mind. This acceleration is a painful acceleration, and we have to deal with the chaos that is linked to, the, to this acceleration. But how do we deal with chaos? Should we fight against chaos? Nine. If you fight against chaos, you will be defeated because chaos is feeding upon war. So don't make war against chaos, like George Bush, who made the war against uh, uh, drugs. Uh, and then the second George Bush made the war against terrorism, but the result is not being a good result. So don't make war. Don't wage war against chaos. So what should we do? We should listen to chaos because it is inside chaos that we can find the energies and the, the modes, the forms, the shapes of a new possible life. Probably no more identifiable with the history of the human embodiment. It's, uh, it's again a problem of embodiment. Probably the relation between our consciousness out of its brain, beyond the decayed brain, our consciousness want to embody in something different, like uh, the Haraway's critters. And it's not a problem of South against North. South uh, is not to be, to be the good solution. No. The end of the Northern white supremacy is only the beginning of a chaos that will possibly be the threshold of a finally post-human. Franco. We have a couple of questions in the chat, one from Noah, if we want to start there. I love your notion of depression as a starting point. Would you connect it to something like Heidegger's angst as in distancing, or do you think depression with an ontological dimension, or yeah, is it no, more? No, I, I, I want to answer the question of Christina Albu. Okay. Because it's very interesting, I see. Okay. How do you define consciousness versus will? Consciousness and will are absolutely two different, very different concepts. What is consciousness? Well, it's not easy to say, uh, but uh, I am just reading uh, a book uh, by Damaso Alonso, the, the, uh, speaking uh, about uh, the, the 
the meaning of the or the different meanings of the word conscious. Anyway, I will be I will be short on this point. Just I will say that consciousness is the ability of mind to think about itself and to solve problems, to make decisions about undecidable subjects. This is consciousness. Consciousness is different from intelligence because intelligence is the ability to decide about decidable alternatives, mathematical alternatives, let's say, uh, simple. Intelligence is the ability to decide about decidable alter alternatives. Consciousness is something much more refinate because it's the ability to decide about alternatives that are not decidable. The aesthetic alternative. Do you like uh, this or that? The ethical alternative. Do you think better to act in a way? or in another way. Uh, these are not decidable alternatives. And only consciousness as the ability to reflect on itself can deal with this kind of undecidable alternatives. But you ask me about something different because you tell me what is the difference between consciousness and will. What is will? Will is the act of deciding in a situation of freedom. Are we free? <laughs> that is the point. Well, the idea of freedom that we have, that, that word has been overspoken too many times. I, I listened to the word freedom. But at the end, the only uh, interesting answer to the question, what is freedom? I find in the books of Jonathan Franzen, who say people came to this country, meaning the United States of America, because of money and freedom. If they don't have money, they very much want freedom, freedom of killing themselves or uh, Having weapons, having weapons. This is the final content of the American freedom. Freedom uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a lie. Freedom is a lie, that is the point. The, the problem of freedom has to be reframed in terms of determinism and indeterminism. I believe in indeterminism, not in freedom. I think that, yes, actually, the physical determination of my brain is incomplete, is never ending. Yes, my brain is physically determined. If uh, I, I get a, a malady of my brain, my ability of thinking is changed, worse than maybe. Who knows? But the point is that the determinism, the determination of my brain is never ended, is never closed. This quantum leap of indeterminism is my way of thinking about freedom. But you see, this has nothing to do with the infinite potency of will that Machiavelli was talking about. Consciousness is the ability to reflect about mind itself. Will is a superstition. The potency of will is a superstition. We think that we can do things if we want to do things. But it, it means nothing because we don't want anything. We don't will anything. We just are led to make choices. Choices between this and that. And 
that kind of choices that we are doing every day, that we are making every day, that kind of choices are of two kinds, are choices between decidable alternatives and choices between alternatives that cannot be decided. So you see, it's not really a problem of will, it's a problem of perfecting, of refining consciousness, making consciousness more and more able to detect the possibilities that are around us, detecting possibilities. This is the task of consciousness in a political sense, not will. Will is an aggressive superstition, of course, Take me metaphorically. I'm not saying that will is a non-existing faculty. I know that I, I can will uh, to eat or not to eat, but at the end, no, actually I cannot tweet. <laughs> I cannot, I cannot. If I am hungry, I will eat. If I don't have food, I can be hungry and I will not eat. Call it will. I like your complicated statement of depression of potentially violent things. Ah, well, uh, first of all, uh, I start from the beginning of the question that is asking David. Thank you, David. Um, depression is a potentially violent, but also generative, he says. Yes, let me repeat it because it's important. In my opinion, this is the, the most important political thing that we have to understand now. One. We, the post-COVID age is marked by a pandemic of depression. We live inside the pandemic of depression in the spe special sense that psychiatrists give to the word depression, which means a fall of desiring tension towards reality and means the inability to Imagine the future. This is depression, and we live in this kind of symptomatology. Generally, we think that depression is a bad thing, and actually is not so good, especially from the point of view of, of personal suffering. But at the same time, depression can become, can turn into an evolutionary transformation of our relation with uh, the other. Why so? Because uh, we have been obliged in the last, uh, in, in, the, in the age of uh, modern capitalism, we have been obliged to think in terms of permanent mobilization of our energies. This is over. The permanent mobilization is over. I call it psycho-deflation. Psycho-deflation has to be interpreted and it has to be elaborated. We can elaborate it in psychoanalytical and political terms and poetical terms. We can elaborate this depressive situation in a way that re opens our ability to live time and the relation with the others outside of the productive acceleration. This is my just a precision about the problem of depression that is so important for me. Um, then you ask about uh, black American artists uh, uh, and so on. I have not seen the Jordan Peele's uh, movie and so on, but uh, I would say 
just to to reply your your your, your question that obviously yes we the the the, the white race the 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 white side of the of the human uh, evolution we are living in a condition of permanent denial up to the point that we have been led to distinguish between capitalism and racism and we think oh racism is so bad but capitalism is good um, read Cedric Robinson, a black American Marxist, who explained very well that capitalism without racism simply does not exist. Simply does not exist. Capitalism without slavery simply does not exist. So if you want to speak about racism, please speak about capitalism. If you want to end racism, please do something to end capitalism. Francesco Manarini, there have been reference to epigenes in Friday meeting and they touch. Oh, yes, of course. Of course. I, I did not say anything about the problem of neuroplasticity because I think that we all agree on that. Uh, Warren has uh, uh, written things about this concept, has, tuned, has done important things uh, at this level. And I think that. We have been working in the past five, six years. I remember the psychopathology and cognitive capitalism of London, where when the crucial, uh, it was five years ago, maybe, the crucial subject was exactly the relation between biological history of the brain and neuroplasticity. We can not uh, imagine anything about the future of the brain, but also about the future of the world. If we don't start by from the understanding that obviously the brain is physically determined in its history, but the brain is continuously meeting alternatives, like every uh, entity in the universe. Every entity in the universe is continuously choosing between two different alternatives. Well, the problem is that neuroplasticity can be understood and, uh, if I can say, managed in philosophical terms and in political terms if we understand that the choice is never, never a determined choice, is never a decidable choice. Neuroplasticity is the ability of consciousness of going beyond the terms. Apropos the pressure, it's uh, Philip Dotson. Are you a pessimist? And the response, not pessimist, just do with it, something like. This is our starting point today. Uh, well, the word doomed can be a good translation of resigned. And I declare that I am resigned. But uh, please remember that I said that res resignation means something more than accepting the, the unavoidable. Resignation means also deserting, dismissing, abandoning, leaving, going away, nomadically abandon the, the, the present reality. Third, resignation means uh, re-signifying the world, re-signifying our relation with the world. Could the great resignation be summarized as choosing quality of life of a standard of living in that direction? And the life of person can imagine how many people are prepared to. Well, that is the political question for tomorrow. Uh, the uh, who is. Uh, um, oh, it's Barry, uh, say this. Um, 
it is the political question for tomorrow. I mean, I think that more and more people, young people, and not all young people, are understanding that there is no way out. That we are, we are not doomed, because in the concept of doomed, uh, yes, doomed. Uh, if I, you know, I am not an English. Uh, uh, I, 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 I don't uh, know English well enough, um, as you can see, as you can hear. But the word doom, in my perception, does not only mean uh, submitted, obliged to accept, also means mentally submitted. So. I don't think that resignation means uh, uh, submit your mind to the unavoidable. On the contrary, it means accept the idea that the promise was fake, was false. So you have to create a new expectation. This is resignation. Resignation is renouncing to what was false inside your expectations. I'm sorry, but uh, I am I am on the brink of collapse, yeah. mental and most of all physical. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Franco. That was super amazing. Thank you for all your time. Thank you for everyone's questions. Give Thank a big round of applause to, for to super all of lecture. you. And uh, I hope we'll meet uh, somewhere uh, sometimes. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And we will see you back here at the space at uh, 1, 1 p.m. today. And thank you, everybody who is tuning in on YouTube. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with, I believe, Victoria Vesna, if I remember the schedule correctly. So thank you. See you tomorrow.